tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to close that door. Uh, okay, today is uh, Tuesday, January 20th. And this Third is 20th. 20th. Yeah. And this is Chris Payton, and I'm here with Michael Goldson. And we're checking to see if the recorder's working. Conversation from that room. It just so happens that it's kind of a busy day today. She's just right now, she's talking to me about it's, it's our accounting, one of our accounting offices. Well, I think we're ready to go. Okay, fine. Well, let me just say that uh, as I look back uh, on when I first saw Johnny, didn't before I ever knew him, it was in the early 30s, and I used to, I lived in Flatbush. And we used to go to a beach called Man Manhattan Beach. And they used to play ba bands. They would have bands come and play weekends. And they had Paul Whiteman there. And the way I deduced it was that I remember Johnny singing, Bang, Bang, Here Come the British, mm -hmm. with the band. And as I recall what he looked like, he was very preppy. And I, I visualized him wearing uh, saddle shoes and, and you know, uh, a, crew neck sweater with his t shirt out but that's how I remember Johnny but it, I had no idea that one day I'd become associated with him but that's that's how far back I remember him and uh, uh, of course I, I followed his career from then on but <clears throat> I first got to know Johnny when uh, Glenn Wallace who was head of Capitol Records, created Capitol Records, put together the combination of Johnny and Buddy De Silva and himself. Uh, Glenn was a great organizer, although he, he, it was, he was kind of inbred as an organizer because prior to that time he had started out in Hollywood <clears throat> as a radio repairman. He had a little shop and then he uh, he expanded it, and, and he finally wound up open, opening up on the corner of Sunset and Vine Music City, which was a record store, and because he he uh, had a liking for, uh, for electronic things, he decided it would be a good idea to have a little booth where he could record people. And so uh, that's when he first met Johnny, when... when uh, Johnny came in and did some demos in his little studio there. And finally, at, this was during the war, about 1941, there were no major record companies out here. All the companies were back east. There was um, Decca, there was RCA, there was Columbia, and uh, Warner Bros. hadn't even started yet. But, uh, and there was kind of a little jealousy because there was no, no record company <clears throat> out in California uh, of note. There, there were some local record companies. And so Glenn Wallace and Johnny got together and said, Gino, you know, we ought to start a record company. There's so much talent here that, and we don't have any outlet for it. We had to go through these New York companies. DEC had a good office here. RCA had an office. Columbia had an office here. And so they finally uh, got together and they needed a, some money, a backer. And they got Buddy De Silva, who had, was a producer at, at uh, Paramount Pictures. Now Buddy had been a very successful Broadway producer. At one time he had three hits running on Broadway at the same time. Forget that they were Panama Hattie, DuBarry was a lady, and one other one. <clears throat> and then he was brought out to California and became a very successful producer of uh, films for, for Paramount. Well, because of the connection, be and Johnny had worked out at Paramount, so he knew Buddy. And so Buddy came in, and I think he put up the municipal fund of $25,000 to start the Don Company. And they were able to uh, finance it through uh, uh, foreign deals, etc. And they got lucky right away. They had they they started off with hits like Cow Cow Boogie, and it, it became uh, they be, they became very successful overnight. Big problem was getting shellac during the war. It was a big problem, but they managed 
to make a deal with a plant back back east. And because of Glenn Wallach's ability as a business manager and a businessman that, that they succeeded. And Johnny went right along. Johnny, I think, was president at one time. So uh, <clears throat> Johnny was handling all the artists. He would pick the artists. Glenn was great at picking people, but not at picking talent. That, Glenn was was what they called, uh, uh, in a friendly way, a square. He, you know, he, his taste in music was <clears throat> old-fashioned and whatnot. So Johnny, it was Johnny's taste that was reflected. And they, they luckily they hired people who were uh, able to continue in the creative end to, to augment Johnny's taste, like Johnny brought in Margaret Whiting and, and, uh, uh, and, and Glenn Wallach's, because of his friendship with a man named Carlos Gastel, brought in Nat Cole and uh, Stan Kenton and Peggy Lee. These are all people that were handled by Carlos Gastel. And then they brought in a man named Dave Dexter, who was a well-known jazz writer at the time. And Dave built up the jazz catalog with a lot of great artists, uh, like Nellie Lutcher, and he, he really helped develop that. So it, it was a matter of, of Glenn finding people to do the work, and Johnny, at one time was the only one picking the artists, and suddenly they now had a great crew. They picked up a guy named Jim Conklin, who was a good organizer for running the creative end. And, and Glenn remained head of the administration, and Johnny was, the, the, uh, was called president at one time. So, well, the funny part of it is that uh, after a while, it, the routine got a little bit too much for Johnny. He had a okay title pages and, and everything, and, and he'd be out playing golf or out at a party the night before, and he couldn't get in the office on time, you know, in time to do the work. And it got piled up so that they realized eventually that Johnny was not going to be able to handle all the work that was piled up, and it was also interfering with his career as a writer and a, and a performer. So somehow or other, they, they got Johnny to agree to step down as president. I think Glenn Wallach was made president. So, but, that, and everybody wanted to know, you know, just about uh, how, uh, how he felt about it, you know. And so here's a letter that he wrote to me in 1950. And look at the, and you'll look at the back, and you'll see the irony of the thing. <clears throat> ex president. Yeah, the return Capitol address Records. is John John Mercer, ex president, Capitol Records. I mean, that shows you that down deep, you know, he uh, he felt uh, a little. Uh, not not slighted, but he just was sorry that he could not stay as head of the company because it was impossible. He had too many other things going for him. Mm -hmm. So uh, at that time, uh, when Capital Records started <clears throat> in the early 40s, I was general manager of a company called Leeds Music, mm -hmm. which now is MCA. And... Uh, I felt I was limited at, at, uh, at Leeds because Lou Levy had made commitments <clears throat> for ownership of different people that, that were supposed to be sub rosa, and he and he promised me a percentage, but he couldn't deliver it. It was just impossible. His lawyer said, "Look, you've already promised this guy, that, you know," and so it was. I had to uh, think of. of Moving on, well, Glenn Wallach came to New York uh, on a business trip. Uh, at that time, he didn't have an office. He, he, uh, he used to deal with Scranton Button Works. They did the pressing of the records in Scranton, Pennsylvania. They became very important in financing and because they became the outlet for all his record works. He, so <clears throat> he came to New York, and uh, Dave Dexter, who we hired, had been a personal friend of mine for years, 
And so he said, look me up. And he didn't know anybody in New York. I took him out to see the bands. And, and we got very friendly. And then the next trip he came out, he called me again. And we got, then he said to me, what do you think about Capitol Records forming a music publishing company? And I said, well, I said, everybody else is doing it. Deck has done it. You know, I don't see why not Capitol. He says, well, would you be interested in running it? I said, I would if I could become a partner. I said, my next move is going to be in that direction. So he said, well, let me talk to Johnny and Buddy, and I'll get back to you. Well, he did it, and they, he said they agreed that we'll make it a four-way uh, well, four split. So uh, he said, when can you start? I said, well, I've got to give him a month notice. So I gave him a notice, and... Uh, it was then I would start in September of 1943, and I would open an office in New York <clears throat> and eventually branch out. Uh, so th they he brought me out to California when we made the deal, and I met Johnny and Buddy, and and Glenn. We went to lunch at Paramount Pictures uh, Commissary, and it was you know. I was, <clears throat> to me, it was a wonderful step forward, and, and I entered a new world because, uh, you know, mingling with people like Johnny Mercer and Buddy Silva was quite a treat. So uh, I started to have a relationship with Johnny Mercer, and since uh, he didn't have any publishing prior to that time, he had, was friendly with various publishers, and when he did a, a motion picture, he was obligated to give the songs to the picture company. Mm -hmm. So now, if he had songs that were loose, they, they would go to Capital Song. We call it Capital Songs. But well, the first big hit we had was G.I. Jive. And uh, uh, it became a big hit on Capital. And I think Johnny did it himself. And uh, from then on, uh, he, um, he, he did a, a, I think it was a, it was a radio show at the time, Chesterfield Supper Hour or something, and he wrote a, a theme song for the show uh, about cigarettes, you know, and the name of the song was Dream. You know, dream, and you're feeling blue, dream, that thing, you just watch the smoke rings rise in the air, you'll find your share of happiness there. So dream, dream, dream. It's a very short song, and I heard about it. I heard the song, and I heard about it, and I said, and I my, the man that was helping me run the company at the time was a was his stepson of Buddy DeSilva, Davy Shelley, a terrific guy, a lot of personality, and he was in with everybody in Hollywood, and so he would be a good man for the company. So I, when I heard about Johnny's song, I heard it, I, I called him up and I said, gee, Dave, we got to get that song put right in the company, boy, we, you know, we'll work on it. So he said, well, it's only a theme song. I said, I know, Dave, but it's a great song. Regardless of whether it's a, it's a great song. He says, well, you know, I didn't know whether you wanted it because it was only a theme. I said, oh, God, Davey, whatever you do, I said, get that damn song on, on, on a contract. Put Johnny's name on a contract right away. So he did. And I, I couldn't believe it, but I, I won't mention the name, but a very important person involved in Capital and the musical end of it uh, said to me one day, is that true that you're going to publish Dream? I said, yeah. He says, well, you're going to work on it like a number one song, which means you're going to plug it. I said, yeah, I think it's a great, great song. It's funny. He says, boy, I hope you know what you're doing. <laughs> now, this guy was very much involved in the song and all, and I couldn't figure out why these guys were so hesitant about this song. I, I mean, I mean, I had some training in the music business, but I had a kind of a, an instinct about songs, and I felt that this, this was a surefire hit. So I got it all straightened out. Well, the Pipe, the pipe pipe is recorded, and everybody in the, in the world recorded the song. You know, it, it became a, a, a tremendous hit, sold over a million copies of sheet music. And... Uh, that was uh, that was uh, my first, you know, experience with Johnny, or second, really, because 
Columbia. At that time, we had Frank Sinatra did it on Columbia, and the Forties that did it on Decca. Vaughn Monroe did it. Freddie Martin did it. And so, there's a copy of the song. And uh, so Jenny felt very good about it because our little company was able to make, to make a national, worldwide hit. If you want to copy us for your archives, oh, love you can it. have it. We love it. So that was the beginning. That was the beginning of uh, a, a great feeling that Johnny and I had together because I was able to to, to take a song of his and make it an, a worldwide hit. It was a tremendous, tremendous hit. So from then on, uh, we worked together. He, he there's a song he wrote uh, called Duration Blues. Oh, I love Duration. Huh? You know I the song? I love Duration Blues. Uh, this is one of his, and. Uh, is this for the archives? Pardon me? Yeah, you can have that. I, have, I picked out certain songs for the archives. Wonderful. Uh, and, uh, and so during the time when he was with us, he didn't give us a lot of songs, but. Uh, capital, the, the Capital Sheet Music Company. Yeah, he did. you know, the sheet, well, it was called Capital Music, uh, Capital Songs. songs. But. Uh, did you get Strip Polka? No, no, no Strip Polka was. It was before I started it with did. him. Yeah, that was that was another big hit that Capital had. Yeah, but no, that was before I I, I came into the picture. But uh, trying to uh, to <clears throat> digress for a moment and, and get into the personal life with Johnny. Uh, Johnny invited me to uh, Palm Springs. It was in a, it was 43 or 44 at a place called the Deepwell Ranch. It was a f kind of a place that all the big picture people came to. It was at that time Palm Springs was a delightful resort. It wasn't as big as it is now. And this was a place where you drove into this long driveway, like a quarter of a mile into this real ranch where they had horses. And, and it, was, it was quite a, a, a retreat. And uh, we, I was his guest for the for the weekend, and and we had a, a, a barbecue party one night, and I, he introduced me to a, a neighbor of his from the beach called Robert Young, and his family were there. So I was kind of brought into the thing, and and, and of course Johnny was such a great host, you know, but he did have, you know, I guess it's no secret. Uh, he had a drinking routine, I'm going to put it that way, <laughs> in which uh, when he first started to drink in the evening, he would be jolly and sing his songs and have a ball. And then the second stage is when he <clears throat> got his sense of humor at that point when, uh, of drinking was to insult people. I mean, he, he meant no harm by it. In fact, he thought it was, a, you know, it was a, it was this, uh, it was his sense of humor, mm -hmm. and and of course, some people didn't understand it and took umbrage at it. But most of those who were friendly with Johnny knew that he was just that was just Johnny. It was his way of being funny. Mm -hmm. Then the third stage is he went into a corner and went to sleep, <laughs> and that was his routine. Wherever he went. That was his routine when he went to a party. So uh, then uh, another year later, he had a house at the beach. Uh, it was called Broad Beach. It's, 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 it's called Trancus. And it's, it's a section off the Pacific Coast Highway, a uh, side road between the highway and the ocean. Mm -hmm. There's a road that goes down, and then there's a group of houses and these were very expensive beach houses, and, and the, the elite of Hollywood lived there. And so I was invited down for the day. <clears throat> and I got there about 11 o'clock, and uh, Johnny and I went on the beach. We threw a ball around or something, and we tossed around and went for a swim, and, and came 1 o'clock and no mention of lunch, and 2 o'clock no mention of lunch. And I'm starved, you know, I hadn't had anything since early morning. 
So Johnny uh, was in the house and he said, uh, you want me to fix you some gumbo? I said, oh, Johnny, I'd love it. <laughs> I was really starved. So he fixed me a pot of, he had a pot of gumbo, you know, that was prepared. And he just heated it up and I had some gumbo. Then we spent the rest of the day horsing around and uh, came nightfall. He invited Robert Young and his family over for drinks and they started to drink. I'm, I'm, I wasn't good at that, but I just kind of <clears throat> joined in socially. And it was 8 o'clock, no mention of dinner, 9 o'clock, no, 10 o'clock, no mention of dinner. Finally, at midnight, you know, these folks are drinking, and uh, uh, Robert Young said uh, to his wife, uh, mentioning uh, his mother-in-law, uh, can, uh, can Susie fix us some ham hocks and beans? So she went next door and fix up a pot of ham hocks and beans and that was our dinner about one o'clock in the morning and that was his routine i mean there was no orderliness there was no thing where you came to his house and and the table was set and uh, ginger would have a nice dinner that that was never part of his routine he was a free spirit in that sense and so uh <clears throat> so about 1950 I, uh, because I was in charge of copyrights for Capitol Records, uh, no, I, I'm, I'm going ahead of myself, and uh, I don't want to inject my life story into this, but in order to put things in, in chronological order, in 1948, uh, Capitol Records it became a public corporation, and because it became a a public corporation, Johnny and, and Buddy and Glenn couldn't be actively engaged in the publishing business. It would be a conflict of interest because the, the, the record company wouldn't be benefiting from it. Mm -hmm. Prior to that time, they were it was a private company and so they could do it any way they wanted. So they came to me and, and they said, look, uh, you have a choice whether you sell out to us, you, you buy us out, or, but, or else what we'll do is we'll put the company on ice, you come in the, to California, open up just companies for, the, for capital records, and you run them. And I said, well, the third choice seems to be the best for me. So I did that. I moved out to California, 48, and we headed the capital records company publishing. And I was in charge of copyrights, and they had a thing called Bozo the Clown. Mm -hmm. And I was in charge of Bozo the Clown. So, you know, when I get into something, I like to do it right. Well, I got to this, into this thing, and I found costume makers and mask makers and all, and I had about 20 outfits made up so that a person could look like Bozo with the outfit in the face. And I sent them around to the branches and we had bozos working all over the country and we had licensees. And be, but before I knew it, I was getting so deeply involved in, in bozo that I, I neglected my publishing. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is not you know, where I want to go. So <clears throat> I had a, a, an opportunity to get involved in another outside enterprise which I won't go into, but it was a very, uh, it was something that Capitol Records would, would join in at one time. And so I went to Glenn and I said, you know, Glenn, I'm not very happy in the role of Bozo's manager and whatnot. I said, so I, I'd like to go back into the publishing business on my own. So he said, well, would you like to, to buy us out? Said, I'd love to. So he arranged it financially. I won't go into details, but I was able to, to buy him out, Glenn and, and, and Johnny and uh, Buddy De Silva. And I went in business for myself <clears throat> and I left Capitol Records. When was this? This is 1950. But my relationship with Johnny was still very, very good. You know, although he wanted me to. He wanted to stay with me. Mm -hmm. 
and I, and I didn't want to stay with him for one main reason, and that is because he did a lot of picture work. I couldn't get those songs. If, if he wrote a song for a picture, he couldn't give it to me. So I'd be sitting there, you know, waiting, and people, uh, songwriters would say, well, that's Johnny's firm, you know. <clears throat> He's not going to give any attention to outside songs. He's going to, and here I'd be sitting there waiting for him to write me an, an independent song when he'd be tied up with very lucrative deals for picture songs. So I said, it's not going to work out. And I, so I decided to, to go on my own and, and Johnny, uh, <clears throat> well, he was gracious about it, but he would have wanted to stay with me. It wasn't until some years later that he went in business. A few years later, he went in business with somebody else. But in the interim, he would bring me songs. And he'd say, I want you to be my publisher on this, which, you know, which thrilled me. Like, here's one of the songs. Here's one of the songs that he gave me. A great, great song, by the way. I don't know if you know, if you if you know what if you know about it, but it's one of the the most original ideas about speaking to them to uh, people on uh, out of space. It's a funny, funny song, and and was recorded by him and and Wingy Minow, who also was a good friend of mine. <clears throat> well, so around 1950. Uh, before oh, before I left Capitol Records, in nineteen early in nineteen fifty, well, we had a man in in France who represented Capitol Records, and I had met him, and I said uh, his name was Serge Glixen. I said, you know, Serge, I said you're in, you're able to hear a lot of good French songs, and, and I'm, I love French pop songs. If you hear anything. Send him out, send it to me, maybe I can get the rights to the United States. So he went back to France, sent me a pile of records this time. And I listened to them and I heard one song, <clears throat> I think Edith Piaf had recorded, called La Foy Mort. And I listened to it and I said, oh man, this is the greatest song <clears throat> that I've ever heard. And so I got a hold of him and I found him, named the publisher, and I made a deal. And I went to a fellow named Jim Conklin, who was my step up. I mean, I had to get okays from him if I had a. And the guy wanted $600 advance from France for the song, and I had to go to Jim Conklin. So I played the song for Jim, and he asked me what I thought. I said, I think it's a great song. And Jim was kind of a little bit tight on money, but he said, How much does he want? He says, 600. I said, well, I'll give it to him. So if he said no, I would have had it my own song for him, you see. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, fine, it'll go into capital songs. But it, the stipulation was that I had to get a lyric within four months. So I, get, I played it for Johnny. <clears throat> and Johnny said, oh, that's a, yeah, that's a real pretty song. And he said, uh, I, I said, John, uh, would you like to write the lyric? Yeah, I'll, I'll get it. I'll get to it. So I gave him the lyric, and I, we, we, I was busy with other things, and, and uh, finally it came to, came to about, it was three weeks before the deadline, and I hadn't had the lyric. So Johnny lived on uh, uh, Suiza, mm -hmm. the street of Parallel Sunset, mm -hmm. right down below the, where the hotels are, etc. And... Uh, I called him up and I said, you know, John, I said, I don't have that lyric, I don't know what I'm leaves. And it was only a short song. You know, it was not a big song. And a easy, I mean, a, to me, it sounded like you could write that 20 minutes, you know. But here it was uh, almost three months and he hadn't written it. So he said to me, uh, oh, yeah, Mickey, I like that song very much. It's a beautiful song. I said, well, what about the lyric? He said, you know, I'll tell you what. He says, I'm going to um, New York on Wednesday, the day it was. And uh, why don't you drive me to the train and I'll write the lyric on the train and I'll send it back, you know, I'll wire it back to you. I said, that's fine, John. So, <clears throat> came Wednesday, I'm supposed to pick him up, say, one o'clock, and I'm 
It was the day I'm going to move from Las Feliz, where I lived, to out to the valley. And the landowner's giving me a bad time because my kids scratched the wall here or something. And so I had to deal with this man, and I had to go pick up Johnny, take him to the train. So I was about 10 minutes late or so, getting to his house. So I drove up to his house, and I see him sitting on the steps of his house. And I walked up, I said, gee, John, I'm off as I am. I'm late. I said, I got no problem with the damn landlord. I said, but, uh, you know, we got plenty of time to make it. He said, yeah, well, I didn't, you know, know if, you, if something happened or so. He said, so while I was waiting, I wrote the lyric. Here it is. Here it took him three. You want to change the tape? need to change the tape. <clears throat> okay, we're back on again. So, uh, here was, he had the lyric for, for three months and nothing happened. And, the, you know, that the day I'm supposed to pick him up to New York, but because I was late, he wrote the lyric, and, and, he, and he wrote it on the back of an envelope or something. And, I, and as I'm driving, he read it to me, and, and tears came to my eyes. <clears throat> it was just such a great lyric, one of those sunburned burn hands I love to hold. You know, things, everything about that lyric was just so... So mercerish, you know. Well, I, I, I took it to record companies, and, and they grabbed uh, Dave Cap, who was head of Decker at the time. When he heard the song, he said to me, "You know, Mickey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this song a dozen times. I don't, I'll give it to everybody that's on the label." And strangely enough, he never had did have a big hit with it. He gave it to Crosby and everybody. A few years later, when he went in business for himself, he gave it to Roger Wagner, it was Cap Records, and that became a big smash. I think that became the biggest record without the lyric. It was just, you know, it was an instrumental. So Johnny came to me one day, <clears throat> two years later, and he said, you know something, Mickey? He said, Autumn Leaves is the biggest income song I have ever had. And I only wrote the lyric to it, and I only collect in the United States and England. That's how big the song was. He says, I owe you a hit, <clears throat> which he never did <laughs> uh, make good on. But uh, that was what happened on, on, on that song. Of course, you know, it's become a tremendous standard. So the same publisher had Another song I liked called, uh, see, it was called, uh, at one time, <clears throat> it was called uh, Le Chevalier de Paris. And this was also a, a, a Edith Piaf record. And it was a thing with verses and chorus. And it, to me, it, it felt like a great song. And at that time, <clears throat> I was friendly with an, another big writer. That, I, I won't mention his name. but So I went to him with the song, and I said, this is a great song. You know. So the guy took the song, and he only wrote the chorus. The chorus, and the, the song went, da-da-da-da-da. And now he wrote, when I dance with you, and you're in my arms. You know, I said to him, you know, I said, that, that doesn't feel important enough for this kind of a song to write about when you're in my house. So the guy took, you know, took offense at that. And he said to me, well, if you want an important lyric, get an important writer. So I said, myself, I think I will. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to Johnny with the song. Mm -hmm. And I got him a translation of it. And he looked at me and he said, geez, I love this thing. He said, I, I, I really feel it. And he went over the lyric with me, you know, the French translation. And then three days later, he came back with a male lyric, three verses and three choruses, and a female lyric, three, ver three verses and three choruses. And when I showed this song around, Everybody that I showed to, you know, couldn't wait to, to 
to give it to an important artist. And, and of course, the artists that we got on the thing were just tremendous, you know, including Sinatra, people like that. It was just, it was such a dramatic song. As a matter of fact, Alan Sherman, who was a satirist, I don't know if you know who he is, sure, was on a program I happened to be watching, and they, they were talking about lyric writers. And he said to me, he said, Johnny Mercer, who wrote When the War Was Young, is one of America's greatest poets. He said to, that that was what he said about him. You can have a copy if you wish. Let me ask you something. Yeah. About this, this is one of my favorites too. Yeah. Um. Did you ask him to write a female lyric, or did he just do that on his own? He did it on his own. It was it common. We've noticed that for several of his songs. Um, have you got any Castles, Baby? One of his earlier yeah. songs has the boys' version, a girls' version. Yeah. This one has male and female right. versions. Was that standard thing to do? Well, if if the song itself couldn't go either way. Yeah, in other words, if uh, if a song uh, was written for a man, uh, it would limit it, and so uh, there was always an option in somewhere to change, either change the lyric or add add lyrics that the girl could do. And Johnny was uh, smart enough to realize that, and and he, I mean, like Peggy Lee recorded it. Well, she wouldn't have recorded it if it didn't have a girl's lyric. Right. And so it it, it opened it up. Uh, <clears throat> to to both men and women, but Johnny was a pro, and so I didn't even ask him to write a man and a woman's lyric, but he did. I mean, for example, uh, he, uh, one of his own songs that he wrote was a, a male song, one for my baby. Mm -hmm. it, uh, you never hear a woman sing that. Well, actually, Margaret Whiting does a marvelous job with it. Well, she may she <laughs> could, well she could probably figure a way to get around it. But and I guess women do it, but uh, but but Johnny was smart enough to uh, to do that, you know. One other thing that we we think that we've noticed um, over the years in when people ask questions and we pull the sheet music out and we show them yeah. various things, he seemed to do the women's point of view awfully well. And his mm -hmm. women have real style with the way they express. I mean, you would yeah. you would expect they would anyway because any of his of his voices. In, in lyrics would have right. style because he did. Yeah. Did anybody ever comment on that, or, or have you heard anything? No, not not, not to the extent that, that he uh, wrote well for women. Uh, I mean, he just wrote well. Yes. Uh, you see, and, and, and when you come to think of it, and, I, and I've been thinking about it lately, is this, that Johnny was an amazing writer in this respect. <clears throat> he wrote lyrics, he wrote one of the great instrumental lyrics on Satin Doll. Yes. Or, or he did uh, uh, Aurora Borealis. Uh, yeah, the thing. Lips Are Like a Red and Ruby Chalice. Is that Midnight Sun? Yeah, with, uh, that was... Uh, I can't remember which title that goes with. Yeah, it was, became, I, I got it here somewhere. And, and so he wrote for Duke Ellington or for Benny Carter in that case. He wrote for Jerome Kern, he wrote for Hoagie Carmichael, what a Southern type song. He wrote uh, with Harold Allen. Uh, he wrote with Rimsky Korsakoff. He came to me one day and he said, you know, Mickey, there was a certain songwriter that he wasn't jealous of him or anything, but it just it rubbed him the wrong way that the guy had taken a PD song and put a lyric to it out of it out of it. Mm -hmm. And so he said to me, yeah, you know, he says, I'm going to do the same thing. He wrote a lyric to Song of India. Now, this is after he left me. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, uh, a, you know, after uh, he, he left, this is 1953. He, came, he Which was so nice of him. He came, I had this little publishing company and struggling to make it. Mm -hmm. And here's Johnny Mercer comes in and said, would you publish Song of India? I said, would I? <laughs> And he wrote this incredible lyric, and to this day, I mean, Frankie Lane called me about oh, a year ago. Was and he just re-recorded? He says, "Mickey, this is the greatest lyric ever written." He says, "I do it in in clubs. People go out of their minds." He says, "This is tremendous." So he says, I, "I'm tired of this guy writing public domain songs." He says, "You can publish it." So he so he gave so he gave me the song and. 
And it, and it was, the, the song was so long, and it took, you know, three, four minutes to sing it. So you just can't go to a, to an artist, you know, and, and ask him to record the song, it was, because it was such a, a uncommercial at that time. Well, I went to Dave Cap, who was then head of RCA. He had gone from, uh, somehow or other he wound up at RCA Records. And I said, you know, Dave, <clears throat> I said, I got a song that I'm going to play for you that uh, I hesitate about it because I can't say it's, it's commercial. I said, but it's by Johnny Mercer and Rimsky Korsakoff. He says, well, then I got to hear it. <laughs> so I played him a demo of the singers, and he listened to it, and he looked at the lyric, and he said to me, you know, Mickey, he said, I wouldn't be worth being in the music business if I didn't record this song. He says, this is a classic. He says, I'm going to give you Mario Lanza. Well, if a little publisher, you know, walking in off the street with a song would get Mario Lanza. But I had a good relationship with people. And when I told Johnny, he was thrilled. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's be become a classic. And so, but the thing about it was that Johnny was grateful to me. And he kept bringing me songs. <laughs> I... I brought him a song, <laughs> uh, which she recorded, and, and he fixed up the lyrics a little bit. But he and Nat recorded it. it oh, I love that song. recording. It was, and I've, I've uh, yeah. coincidentally, I was a co-writer on the song. But this is when I. <clears throat> what is the story on this? This is Save the Bones for Henry Jones. Well, actually, the story is uh, Danny Barker was a guitarist. Mm -hmm. Played in jazz bands and whatnot, and he was married to a, a, a singer called Blue Lou Balker, mm -hmm. a, a, who was a blues singer at the time. And he was friendly with me. He came up my office in uh, in New York, and I, <clears throat> you know, I would I had some, a good relationship with with uh, Danny Barker. And he said, you know, there's a guy that, that comes around in Harlem where he lived, and uh, we stand around on a corner, and everybody goes out right. to dinner and leaves this poor guy alone. And, and the guy happened to be a fighter. He was a, Henry Jones was a heavyweight boxer. I used to see him fight on television. <clears throat> and so everybody would go off and leave him alone. And as they went away, he said, save the bones for Henry Jones, because Henry don't eat no meat. Well, you know, it got to be a catchphrase, because, mm -hmm. you know, it, was, it got to be so Danny Barker wrote this he brought me the idea, and we sat down and we, and we put the thing together, uh, made it into a song. And when I heard it, I, I you know I flipped out. I said, "This is you know so wonderful, you know about a party and all." And so I I sent it out to to Johnny, and the next thing I know, Johnny and Nat recorded it, and Johnny added one line to it: uh, "Henry don't eat no meat. He's an egg man." Yes. <laughs> That was Johnny's contribution. <laughs> so that was the story of that song. Well, they seem <clears> to have a wonderful time recording it. Yeah, oh, they must have. Yeah, the, it, um... it was a great thing. Well, uh, during this uh, period where after I left Johnny, in 1959, I bought a house down at Lido Isle. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know Lido Isle by any chance? No, Newport but I'm, Beach. I've heard of it. I'm going down tomorrow oh. to Newport Beach well, that to was, talk with I somebody. I still have a house down there. <laughs> Uh, I heard it's beautiful. Yeah, and so I bought a house down there, and Johnny had a house down there. I knew about that, but that wasn't the reason that I bought the house, because I had been going down with my family. We'd rent a place for a couple of weeks during the summer, and I decided that I was I love boating. So, and I have friends down there. Axel Stordahl had a boat. Mm -hmm. Carlos Gastel was Matt's manager. He had a boat down there. So... I bought this house in 59, and, and Johnny lived, he lived on Caron, and I lived on Orvieto, that's K-L-M-N-O, five blocks away. Mm -hmm. And so we became, you know, very friendly, because we still, you know, <clears throat> we, we still had good feelings towards each other. And there were a couple of stories that kind of show you what kind of a guy he was. Uh, he had a little dog, a little beagle, Called Tippy. 
And he loved the dog. He loved it. He used to walk around. He used to walk around the, the island, you know. And I heard this story, and I'm going to tell it to you, even though it's kind of weird. But, but it, it, a, a man told me this who, to whom it happened. It was one of my neighbors. I can't think of who it was now. He said, one evening, he was in his house, and he heard his garbage can being rattled. So he walked out in the back, and he and he saw this man look at going through his garbage, and it was Johnny Mercer. So he said, uh, "Can I help you or anything?" He says, "No, I'm looking for some bones for Tippy." Can you believe it? I mean, it was weird. He had such a feeling for this dog, and so the dog uh, became ill. He had a thing, uh, something to do with the padding of the. the the, the padding of his feet, mm -hmm. and he went. And he had to put him in a vet's, and he would go visit the dog every day. And you know what the dog loved? Mm. Chicken soup. <laughs> he would bring him a bowl of chicken soup every day. <laughs> and that was a, that was a feeling that Johnny had for for him. Now Johnny lived. Uh, see, the island has one boulevard around it. Lido Sud on one side, Lido Nord on the other. He lived near Lido Sud, but he lived, lived about three houses in. So he had no view of, of outside. And he, uh, but he loved to, to go to the bay. And now, he, Johnny had, was a pretty wealthy man at the time. He drove an ordinary car, he drove a, a, a convertible Chevy or something. And he had a, an inner tube, tire, and he'd walk out to the stock on the end of Corona, because right at Corona, if you went out to, to the beach, you crossed the street, and then there was one line of houses, and there was a walkway. It was like a little park and a walkway to the dock. And he would go out to the dock with his tube, and he'd swim off the dock with the tube. He'd paddle around with the tube. Here's a guy, a multimillionaire, and He's sit, sitting out there in a, in a, with a tire tube. He's mm -hmm. the kind of guy he was. So some woman uh, met him at a party one night, and she happened to have an interest in music and all. And, and she said, you know, Johnny, you, you, know, you love the, the water and all. He said, how come you're not living a, at one of the waterfront houses? So he says, well, oh, man, he says, expensive. I can't afford it. He could have afforded, you know, to buy up a whole row of houses, but but he never felt that he was rich. Mm -hmm. You know, he was very modest about that. He didn't live according to his income. He just lived according to his taste. If he wanted something, he bought it. So it was that, it was that kind of a guy. Well, there again, one night, we're invited to go to his house to di for dinner. So. I went o we went over there, my wife and I, and, and uh, funny thing about it, I don't recall uh, Jeff and Mandy being around at all. Maybe at that time they had they started their own lives. But when was this? Well, it had to be in the 60s, early 60s. And so we were there, we went over there one night, and by the way, the house was sold to a friend of my daughter's. My daughter lives on Lido Isle, right across from where we mm -hmm. have a house. And so... Uh, we we're having drinks and, and you know eight nine ten eleven o'clock and we're invited to go for dinner and we're about six or eight people or so mm -hmm. and no no there's no food and so it all what happened was that Johnny invited all these people and never told Ginger they were coming for dinner so Ginger didn't have any dinner prepared so, so after about it was eleven o'clock. We started to phone around to find out if a restaurant was open. We finally found a restaurant, and we all went out there to have dinner. Mm -hmm. But that was the way Johnny lived. You know, he, he was a, a, just kind of a free spirit. It just never occurred to him to tell Ginger that he was inviting these people over for dinner. So we had a nice relationship at that time, uh, you know, while he, he lived there. Uh, oh, then I got to go back to a time... Uh, Oh, I guess it was around 46 or 47. I, uh, 
And Johnny used to come to New York. He had an apartment there. And he used to love to hang around with the boys. You know, so one night, I had a, an appointment with a man from head of RCA, a guy named Herb Handler. And we were going to go to the... Uh, to the Waldorf Astoria Starlight Room, where Xavier Cougat was playing, and the girl singing, I can't think of her name, I think her last name was Warren. And so, I, I didn't have the date with this fellow until like 10 o'clock or so, for the 10 o'clock show at the Waldorf. So I went to dinner with Johnny, and uh, he had a few drinks and all, and then, he said, uh, we all said, let's go up to hear Louis Armstrong. He was working at one of the clubs right on Broadway. At that time, there was a club that had used to have bands. And it was, you know, it was not a very elegant room. It was just a, a big open room with a bar and the tables and all. And Johnny was, you know, was an idol of Louis and, 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 uh, Louis idolized Johnny, you know, but it was kind of a mutual thing, and I had a ball. And so after we sat around, I said to Johnny, I got a date with Herb Hendler at the Waldorf Astoria. I said, Johnny, you want me to take you home? He said, no, why don't you take me with you? Because he had had a few drinks and all, so I said, fine. I said, you know, I mean, I, it was certainly... <clears throat> uh, it was easy to say to people, you mind if I bring Johnny Mercer along? You know, to, 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 so I said to Herb Handler, I said, you mind if I bring Johnny Mercer? He says, oh my God, are you kidding? Bring him along, he's my idol. You know? So we went up to the to the Waldorf Astoria and uh, <laughs> Johnny was, was like one of his second stages at that time. But he said something very funny and just shows you how uh, even a big, talented man like him feels. Cougar was playing medleys of, of Jerome Kern and Gershwin and all. And Johnny turns to us and he says, why doesn't he play some of the new standards? <laughs> he was dying because they weren't playing his songs. Mm -hmm. and, but Cougar was the kind of a guy that played that kind of music. He, did, You know, Johnny's songs were pop tunes. Mm -hmm. And he was playing show tunes and picture tunes and all. But he, you know, inwardly he said, why aren't they playing my songs, you know? Why aren't they playing the new standards? <laughs> so it was quite an evening. And Johnny was uh, at his uh, best and worst that night. In fact, Herb Handler says, that after it was over, he says, I just wonder if I, if I should have said no when you, when you asked him to come along. Well, how much trouble, if any, did his... his... Pardon me? When he drank, and you're not the first person who's told us this, he, yeah. he tended to get insulting. Yeah. How much of a handicap was that? Pardon me? How much of a handicap was that, or how did no, that... No, people accepted it. They did I mean, like, for example, I wrote this down because I'll never forget this. We went out one night with uh, Philippa and Bill Goodwin. Bill Goodwin was a big announcer and actor at the time, a wonderful man. And Philippa was the sweetest woman. And they were very close to Johnny. And Johnny, is in a stage, once came up to Bill Goodwin and he said to him, he says, Bill, you're a bum. He says, I don't know how a nice person like Philippa ever married you. You know, something like that. Mm -hmm. What he meant, he thought it was funny, you know, to say something like that. Well, poor uh, Bill Goodwin felt like this, you know. Sure. And, and, uh, the next day, there were, Ginger was calling up, apologizing to Johnny, but but that was Johnny, you know, you had to accept him, because he didn't mean any harm by it, he just did it, you know? Did, so anyone, was, ever, did anyone ever suggest that maybe he not drink so much? No, because, yeah. uh, well, uh, you, I guess it was hard to tell Johnny something like that, but he did have a problem, let's face it, he did have a problem. Uh, I went to his house uh, one time, this is in the late 50s, early 60s, and when he, this is when he lived in, in Bel Air, mm -hmm. uh, I forget whether it was Bellagio Road or one Chillon. of Is it Bellagio Road? No, Chillon. Ch Chillon Road, right on the golf course, and he had a studio, 
a little a room that he uses had a piano and and he had things stuck on the wall and all and he had a, a lyric stuck up with a pin in it and it said you can't win them all and i looked at the lyric i said what this he says that's the lyric that they turned down on shadow of your smile and he had it stuck up there you know he says you can't win them all and that's so true because i used to say you know a guy like Johnny Mercer is such a big guy, and you, let's compare him to Picasso. If Picasso signed a menu and just put a caricature, it's worth hundred thousand dollars. You know, no matter what he did, it, it, he, it's worth a fortune. But a songwriter, if Johnny writes a flop, it's nothing. You, you're not worth a dime. I can show you some songs that he wrote that never made it. Mm -hmm. But a songwriter, you know, is has to live and die on his hits, not on his flops. Picasso can make a lousy painting, it's worth millions. There's no such thing as a lousy Picasso painting. Mm -hmm. But there is such a thing as a as a unsuccessful Johnny Mercer lyric. So there was that kind of a, a, of a difference between the, the two arts. Uh, it was, let's see what else I have written down here. Uh, Let's see. I guess uh, that's that's about uh, that about locks it up. I'll just show you some of the little. Uh, the one, this is a picture taken about 19, I would say 48 or 49 uh, at Capitol Records, the lounge of Capitol Records, and uh, and as you can see, there's uh, there's. Uh, Johnny and, and Nat Cole mm -hmm. is, and this uh, this guy, Fred Huddleston, is uh, one of the members of the uh, Pied Pipers, and the four of us sitting in this little room, I think, like a little lounge room. Mm -hmm. And one day at, at Lido, I don't know, Johnny came up to me and he said, uh, Gee, Ginger and I thought you'd like to have this picture for your collection. <laughs> So that was taken at Lido, then? It was taken at Lido. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, the guy was so, so you know, so uh, gracious. Well, I guess, you know, I guess uh, I could think of some more things, but... Uh, but personally, the guy had a good heart. Mm -hmm. well, I must say... You know, the guy was not selfish or, or uh, mean-spirited in any way. He was not jealous of anybody. Well, he was envious, maybe, you know, if, if somebody wrote a great lyric. Yes. Uh, but i got <clears> to <throat> tell you a, a, a kind of a side story. Uh, <clears throat> when I left Capitol Records, I, I had a pretty good reputation. And so Sammy Kahn, the famous writer, mm -hmm. came to me and he said, you know, Mickey, he said, now that you're on your own, he says, why don't you and I start a company together? I said, fine, Sammy. So he, he gave me some lyrics, and we got, and he got melodies and all, and uh, nothing was happening. Uh, you know, a, a guy like Sammy Kahn was able to find writers who came up with great melodies, mm -hmm. but the writers that he brought me, unfortunately, were not of that caliber, so we just had... Good lyrics by Sammy, but not great melodies. It wasn't, it wasn't flourishing. And so uh, Johnny brought me a lyric on something, and I loved it. I thought it was great. And so I happened to mention to Johnny, uh, to us, oh, and Sammy Khan once said to me while we were associated, he said, I think Johnny Mercer is the greatest lyric writer that ever lived. He said, if, if he would make me his manager, I'd give up songwriting. This is what he said. So I thought, well, I, I have an ally, you know, and Sammy Kahn, he's my partner in, in this little company. It was a separate company from my own. So one day Johnny brought me this great lyric, and that evening I happened to be having dinner with Sammy Kahn, and I said to him, Johnny brought me a lyric today. It just knocked me out. It was just so great. I just can't tell. Knock me out. Sammy Kahn said, oh, yeah? I didn't realize at the time how we really felt about it, but after all, he told me that he'd give up his mm -hmm. songwriting if, if Johnny would make him his, ma you know, ma his manager. The next morning, I get a call from, from Sammy Khan's manager, 
Sammy would like to break up the company. So I said to him, fine, I said, let's just split it down the middle and, we, and it's all over. He's mm -hmm. out. If he wants out, he's out. And that was the end of it. But it was ironic. All because of the lyric. Oh, because I said to, to this guy that, uh, I, I, that Johnny brought me this great lyric. And I thought he'd agree with me and say, well, let me see it. I want to see it. No, he just, he said, you know, he just took offense at that. And yet he told me that he felt Johnny was the greatest lyric, ever, lyric writer ever lived. Well, I feel that he's one of the greatest lyric writers that ever lived because of his great talent, his ability to write any kind of a lyric, no matter what, a show tune or a picture tune or a, a jazz thing. I mean, there are a lot of jazz songs that have bad lyrics. Mm -hmm. None of them are by Johnny Mercer. Uh, but uh, I think he had, a, he had a very successful life. I don't think it, uh, that... Uh, he missed out on any opportunities, except maybe shadow of your smile. <laughs> but uh, it, it had, was a great experience uh, to be involved with Johnny, uh, and uh, I never never stopped back to, to you know to appreciate the fact that I was involved with him in various things. But I was happy that he said once to me, "You gave me the biggest hit I ever had." I think you were <clears> out of tape. Hang on, just gonna... <clears throat> okay, the greatest hit. Pardon me? You said that he thanked you for giving him the greatest hit. Well, that was it. You know, I, he said to me, you gave me the biggest hit I ever had in, at that time in Auto Leaves. So I felt kind of good about that. Uh, And of course, people to this day, you know, tell me that about when the world was young, how what a great lyric it is. Oh, it's beautiful. It's just gorgeous. <clears throat> so uh, it, let's see. Tim Weston. Yeah, I'll give you his phone number. Uh, let me get my pad. Wonder. <clears throat> I'm going to put this on pause so we don't get it on the tape. Well, that's it. I don't think I have much else to say. Well, I have a couple questions. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, and this just comes from my ignorance of the, of the publishing industry. Sure. We have sheet music. We have sheet music that says Criterion, and we have sheet music that says Capital Songs. And then from a later period, we have music that says Commander. Oh, Commander was his own company. So he started that on his own. Yeah, he About started when? that with a, a fellow named Marshall Robbins. Okay. <clears throat> I was just curious. I was just curious. Oh, yeah. No, that, that was the company that he started. And he had a little company with a guy named Milt Raskin also. Uh, but, well, he I don't think it, it, it had too many uh, the good things. But on Commander, he I think he put, uh, I want to be around it, Commander. Could very well have. Yeah. I know it, it has some of his later things. A fair number of his later things. Are yeah, there, yeah. But well, we weren't sure. Yeah, because he had, it. had the office right across the street here. Oh, really? Up the street. Yeah, the, oh. it was called the lawyer's building. It's uh, right after El Centro. Mm -hmm. There's a an old building there, and he he had an office there. In fact, that you know we were still run into each other mm -hmm. uh, up the street, but we didn't travel in the same circle, you know, except for when we were down Lido and 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 we socialized down there, but. Uh, you know, we kept our friendship going, as, and of course, I, I was sad that Johnny, because of, of the way he conducted his, his personal life as far as his, his eating habits, his drinking habits, you know, that, that didn't add up to a, 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 long, a long and healthy life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure that his diet was uh, was not uh, the healthiest diet in the world. You know, but uh, yeah, he, I know that based on what I saw, he did, didn't have regular hours when he ate. Mm -hmm. and, and so it all added up, you know, but it was it was kind of sad that he, that he did not, was not able to live, a, a, you know, I don't know how old he was when he died. 66, I 66, think. 66 or 67. That's pretty young compared to, oh, very. you know, to what the <clears throat> people are living today, but uh, it's just one of those things. So 
who else are you gonna uh, th that you've got to to talk about, Johnny? Anybody? That... Oh, bunches of people. Let me thank you for the interview. Yeah. I'll turn this off, and then I'll tell sure. you all about it. <laughs>